recording. And let me hide my meeting controls, move that around. Okay, now we can get started. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, welcome to What is Digital Accessibility? Presented by the IT Accessibility Initiative of Department of Disabilities, the Technology Assistance Program. My name is Stephen Polachek. Uh, first, we'll take care of the normal housekeeping items today. Uh, as you can tell, we have an ASL interpreter today. Uh, they are spotlighted, so everyone should have their video feed. If for whatever reason you do not, make sure to pin their, their video feed. Uh, their name is ASL interpreter Tammy, and they should be in the panelists uh, list. We also have captioning available, so you can turn that on from the closed captioning button on the main ribbon of your Zoom feed. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel, uh, hopefully by the end of the week. If not, it will be posted next week. Uh, and finally, this slide deck was sent out ahead of time. If you did not receive it, don't worry. We will send it out again when we send out the recording. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in question and answer. I will be monitoring that and chat, but for the sake of uh, ease of use, please uh, use the Q&A. Uh, that's the better option generally. Uh, with that, we can go ahead and get started. So. The first thing I want to talk about is what is accessibility? Let's define that term. So when you look it up in the dictionary, and I pulled this from Merriam-Webster, accessibility is defined as capable of being reached, easy to speak or deal with, capable of being used or seen, capable of being understood or appreciated, capable of being influenced. And this definition is the one we're going to focus on today, is easily used or accessed by people with disabilities or adapted for use by people with disabilities. This is a general definition of accessibility. Now, digital accessibility is often used interchangeably with web accessibility. And the definition for that, which is from W3C, also known as the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, that definition is web accessibility means that websites, tools, and technologies are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. So all of this points to we are making sure that anything we're posting on the web is accessed by someone who maybe can't see or someone who's hard of hearing, that kind of thing. But what disabilities does this concept apply to? And you know, what are the regulations? Those are the questions we're gonna to answer today. So we'll start with the disabilities. Visual is the one people tend to think of most when this comes up because we, you know, we hear about screen readers or we hear about blindness uh, and we think about, well, how do you use a website if you can't read it? So that's the one people generally go to for digital accessibility. But you also need to think in terms of uh, auditory, cognitive, physical, neurological, and speech. I do want to mention the first four were the ones that were first kind of defined for purposes of the guidelines and standards we'll talk about later. But neurological and speech have been added and, se and uh, separated out from the other areas to give more focus on what is needed for those. So in terms of visual, that's things like alt text for images, or putting descriptions of uh, charts and graphs, uh, making sure that form fields and such work with screen readers and other assistive technology. For auditory, that's things like ASL interpretation, captioning on video, uh, and making sure again that information is in text and not just aud audible. Cognitive, so uh, what can we do to help those who maybe have attention deficit disorder or uh, dyslexia or other uh, disorders that would affect their ability to interpret information. And then physical, so if someone is unable to use a mouse because of Parkinson's and their hands shake too much and they're just using the keyboard, making sure that everything working or everything on the computer 
is able to be done with just that input device or with a separate in input device, such as someone who is in a wheelchair because uh, their limbs are injured or underdeveloped and they need to use a, 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 a like a puff and sip device. And so making sure that device interaction is still accepted as input by the, the program. Neurological has been separated out from cognitive uh, because medically there are some differences. So it focuses on, again, like developmental disorders or uh, sometimes nerve damage and focuses on what might be needed to help in those cases. So if you're thinking like uh, a mobile device and how you have to swipe up or down to move around, what can you do instead to cause the same interaction? And then speech, which comes up a lot in to today's world where we're meeting digitally across these kind of platforms like Zoom. And so not just is it that you're receiving information in an accessible manner, but you're also able to deliver it. So in this case of me speaking to you, if I had a speech disorder, what uh, what accessibility features would I need in order to be able to communicate uh, effectively to you all? So that's the application of these definitions and the uh, technologies and uh, laws and such we'll be talking about today. Now, what technologies do these all apply to? I've already mentioned websites. Uh, that's, again, the first thing people think of. But we also need to think about the content. What also is in your browser? It's not just the HTML code telling you, you know, the text of a news story on the New York Times. It's the, the weather widget that's telling you updated information about what's going on outside. Or it's uh, the, app, the bank application you're going in to pay your bills. Those kind of, you know, programs that are still based in your browser still fall under these uh, guidelines and issues that we're talking about. Second, electronic documents. Everyone's creating Word files, PDFs, EPUBs, all kinds of other electronic documents, and you're sending these to and from each other. But we need to think about when you're putting stuff into those documents, how is that going to be read by someone who is blind or someone who needs the bookmarks in the PDF if it's a really long one in order to be able to just skip to a section. Mobile phones and apps. Mobile phones have become a very dominant method of using the internet and other computer and software. Um, and the apps that go along with it, we need to think about how they're going to work with the accessibility settings in the phone. What accessibility settings are there? Is there something else that might be needed in order to interact on the phone uh, efficiently and without frustration? Software. Same idea as everything we've been talking about, except these are the programs that your computer runs, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, uh, any of those programs and what need, what features and uh, accessibility needs that they have. Uh, and then also, how do you create something using those programs and send it out to people and that'll be accessible as well. And then video and audio, as we mentioned today, or as we started with this, ASL interpretation during a live session, captions, uh, pre-recorded content, having a transcript available, making sure that we're accommodating not just needs and such, but we're giving people choices and the ability to uh, interpret the information we're giving them in a matter that's most effective to them. And then finally, standalone systems. This is referring to things like kiosks, like if you're at the bus station trying to buy a ticket or at the airport uh, trying to check in before your flight. There's still computers, there's still software, but they're considered different legally because you're purchasing, uh, in this case, an entire system that you don't need other systems to work with. And so what is that going to have? Because there's also some physical considerations with that. When you're selling a piece of software and you're considering the accessibility, there's still the operating system of the computer you're putting it on that is a separate question. In this case, since you've bundled it all to one, now you need to think about, well, you need an audio jack for headphones to plug in so that the screen reader that's built into it is still usable by someone and they don't have to broadcast their information to someone who's nearby. So 
these are the technologies that uh, are usually covered by the, the standards and guidelines we'll talk about later. So we have our definitions. We know kind of what they apply to and what we need to think about, but how does this help? What difference does this make? So the first thing, and the arguably most important reason, is allows equal access to information services for people with disabilities. This also includes temporary disabilities, like an injury, you broke your arm, or even minor things like you're missing your glasses or you put them down in the other room and you're trying to do something that's uh, time sensitive, like booking, you know, booking a flight in your account. And so what settings can you use in order to accommodate that? Well, you can turn on magnification if you're missing your glasses and uh, enlarge the screen text so that you can read it without having to go into the other room and get them, or if they're broken or something. If you broke your arm, well, it's going to be tough to use the mouse. Those of you who have broken one, I have multiple times, and you know it's difficult to use the mouse. Well, instead, I can just use the keyboard, and I can use it well enough that it shouldn't really make that much difference in how I interact, so long as the website or program is still accepting of that input it doesn't have issues with uh, not using the mouse. One important statistic to emphasize this is that according to the CDC, about 26% of the US population has a disability. This also filters down to Maryland itself. Maryland has roughly one in four adults uh, having a disability. The majority of them are uh, disabilities that affect mobility, so being in a wheelchair or uh, requiring the use of a cane or unsteadiness, that kind of thing. But that's uh, in and of itself, maybe I think the CDC says uh, 11 to 12 percent, and then the other categories fill up the other 15 percent. So all of those together really make us think about how can we accommodate all those different disabilities and give them ways to use the same services, get the same information without having to go through a more difficult route or being able to use the same thing and also make it easier on our end so that when we send out that information, we only have to send it out once. We don't have to provide four different versions and keep four different versions updated for different categories. That is the concept you'll probably hear of this universal design, where we're providing something that uh, the, the broad majority is able to use. The second point is that, in general, these accessibility improvements also improve the user experience and agency. We're providing alternatives in certain, certain situations such as you're waiting for your flight and you're watching a, a video on your phone, but you don't have headphones. So you can turn on the captioning in order to still be able to understand the content completely if the captioning has been done effectively. So you know, making sure that we're providing those alternatives and giving people the, the ability to choose how to use, the, uh, use these programs and software and websites without having to, uh, you know, either put themselves in, you know, potentially rude situations like in a public space and blasting music across the, the room or uh, giving them the ability to say, yeah, okay, I, you know, I can hear, but the caption does make it easier, especially if someone has an accent. So you're giving people that ability to choose what works best for them. And then also, it, the user experiences, it, it does help a lot with the ability to do what works best for them. I'm repeating myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it, it also makes it less frustrating when they try to use these things because instead of something happening automatically and they're not sure what happened, they're able to click a, a link and they'll know where it's going or when they're submitting a form and that form says, are you sure? They don't have to worry that they made a mistake or something before it goes in and they have to you know, try and send in a new one or call to try and get it fixed, that kind of problem. And then finally, required by law. 
It's the one that will ultimately always end up being pointed to, but it is uh, important because those laws exist in order to get people thinking about this and make these changes. A couple of points regarding this is that the Department of Justice has uh, a number of cases regarding this. Uh, the ADA has been uh, used quite a bit in cases. The case number of cases uh, citing the ADA are rising. It's gone up significantly in the last three years. Uh, they have also issued guidance on ADA compliance, uh, what they think is necessary for a website to be considered accessible, what it applies to. They don't have regulatory standards set in place. We'll be talking more about those later, but they are coming. Uh, there is a hearing scheduled in May regarding the topic. So at some point, they'll have technical standards as well. So regarding that, let's talk more about the laws and standards that apply to this area. So here in Maryland, we have the non-visual access clause. That's Maryland's accessibility law. Put in place in 2005, it was sponsored and written by the National Federation of the Blind, and then it was updated in 2018 to uh, give it some more impact and enforcement capabilities. You've also heard probably of Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. Uh, that is the federal equivalent uh, of, or rather, is the federal law that affects government entities and those working with the government and requiring them to be accessible. Then there's the Americans with Disabilities Act. That applies much more broadly and usually is cited in uh, cases focused on public and uh, private entities rather than government entities. And then finally, on the international level, we have the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So I'm going to start with the NVA and Section 508 because those two are the ones that uh, require government entities to be compliant with a set of technical standards that are laid out in both laws. In Maryland, the NVA focuses more on non-visual access because it was sponsored by National Federation of the Blind, um, but it still directly cites Section 508, so there is quite a bit of overlap between the two. But they effectively say any state department, or in the case of 508, any federal department, when they are putting out services or information to the public, they need to be this level of accessible. Also applies internally. So you have blind employees or uh, employees with uh, another disability, or maybe a physical disability, uh, someone is in, a, is in a wheelchair, making sure that they still have uh, what they need to do their job effectively. They also talk a lot about procurement. So any IT procurements have to be compliant with these standards. So anyone who's providing a product or service to the government has to meet the same standards as the government entity itself. In Maryland, the enforcement capability of the NVA is in the hands of the Department of IT. For 508, it's actually handled by the US Access Board. They have a separate organization that's been created specifically for it. Both entities essentially have the role of determining is something accessible, if it's not, what's going to be done about it, and either working with the department in order to improve it or working with the vendor to improve it. And then if issues arise, if a, a public concern or complaint is filed, they will handle it. We here at the Maryland Department of Disabilities work a lot with the Department of IT to provide the uh, this guidance and enforcement uh, will help a lot with testing and evaluation and such. Now, the ADA is a larger topic. The um, reason for that is, A, it's handled by the Department of Justice. And as I mentioned earlier, there aren't any set standards yet. Instead, they they usually go by either public complaints or concerns, or if uh, an actual case is filed, in which case they will go to the, uh, the, the problematic organization and either offer guidance, or in the case of a court case, it might be settled 
uh, with providing uh, a requirement to either meet a certain kind of standard or to fix a certain issue according to the requirements of the uh, complaint. It covers employment, state and local government services, and businesses and nonprofits. So much more broad topic. It does obviously apply to state and local governments. Those of you in the state, I'm sure you know, you have ADA coordinators at each of your departments. Um, I believe local governments entities will do so as well. So most of you probably uh, familiar with the ADA, but it also applies to public or rather private, sorry, private businesses and nonprofits and making sure that any issues that arise in terms of accessibility with them are, uh, are handled. It does also cover websites. As I've mentioned, they've issued guidance on that. That has been gone going for a while. Uh, and as of March 8, 2023, so last week when I checked the website, there are 97 cases listed on the disability rights cases page. So a lot of cases involving the ADA. Not all of them involve digital accessibility. Some do apply to um, physical accessibility. So like wheelchair ramps to a building and such, but there are still citations involving websites and other online services. There were just over 3,000, sorry, 3,255 ADA lawsuits filed last year. That number is 12% up from 2021, but it has been increasing over the last five years. And they're expecting roughly the same or more this year. So there's a lot more attention paid to this, partially because of the shift to online after the pandemic. So everyone is you know, working through Zoom or working through Microsoft Teams. And there's much more focus on accessibility. So now uh, everyone's kind of trying to play catch up. Uh, back in November, I attended a presentation by the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights at Accessing Higher Ground 2022. Uh, the two presenters were uh, attorneys, one from the Department of Education, the other one was from the Department of Justice, uh, and they talked about how uh, some of the, the work they do and how when they are testing, they're not testing against set standards, they're testing against usability. And so they're trying to either recreate the problem that caused the complaint, or they're finding new issues based on other kinds of testing. So it, it's very broadly applied. And that's why there's always this goal of just keep working at it. You know, total compliance can be very difficult to achieve, especially when we don't have a, a set standard to look at. But it's something we always need to think about and keep working on. Accessibility isn't something that is one and done. So that's the takeaway here is under ADA, we're always trying to make those improvements. And then finally, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. This is also known as WCAG. Uh, they were created by the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. I mentioned them before. That is an organization that is formed of governments, uh, individuals, businesses, and uh, advocacy organizations, specifically to uh, create a testable set of standards to serve as a baseline and promote accessibility worldwide. So these sets of standards also, or WCAG, is a good way to start making something accessible. I do need to note that just meeting those standards doesn't guarantee accessibility. Well, they, there, there's so many cases to cover with in terms of disabilities that inevitably you can't cover everything, but this gives us the, the, the basic needs handled. So things like alt text or form fields or captioning or ASL interpretation. And it lets us have also something we can test against and at least understand, okay, when I send out this website or this newsletter PDF, I know that it's pretty accessible to 
maybe 90 to 95 percent of the population. It's not perfect, but it means that I'm handling the broad requirements needed. And then if further cases come up, I'll be able to handle those without having to handle basic issues like that. They're separated by publication date. So 2.0, 2.1, and then 2.2, which is slated to be published this coming April. Uh, anything older than 2.0 isn't in, really in use anymore. You can probably find it online, but in general, it, 2.0 is your, your starting point. Uh, each of these publications has three levels, single A, double A, and triple A. So single A is your absolute base requirements. As I mentioned, alt text, uh, navigation structure, info and relationships, captioning, uh, that kind of thing. So it's everything you need to make it at any form at all accessible. Double A requirements uh, are usually uh, improvements to the single A requirements or uh, additional adjustments to make it even more accessible. So things like color contrast and uh, providing feedback on errors and making sure that's accessible, that kind of thing. And then finally, AAA, which by and large are improvements of the previous standards. So I mentioned color contrast for the AA requirement. At that level, it's a ratio of 4.5 to 1 for the text color to the background color. There's a AAA requirement for a color contrast that is actually 7 to 1 ratio. So it's an improvement from that previous uh, standard. There are other ones for the AAA, but most of them will just be uh, essentially better versions. Now, the NVA and 508 directly refer to the 2.0 single A and double A standards. So if you're working with uh, in the state or if you're working as a vendor with a, a state entity, and you're, you're you know, wondering how do I meet those laws, in general, the 2.0 single A and double A standards are what you're, you're looking at. Um, there isn't any official movement on changing those to 2.1 or 2.2 uh, across the board. Uh, individual organizations have made the decision to do so. Uh, the White House has you know, issued uh, a statement saying that they will meet the 2.1 single A and double A standards. Uh, here in Maryland, uh, MSDE, Department of Education, uh, they just had a law passed last year holding them to the 2.1 single A and double A standards. They had also prior to then uh, decided internally they were going to meet that standard. So there is uh, there is some movement uh, in individual entities to work towards the higher standards or even future proof against the laws upgrading, but we haven't seen anyone uh, introduce like a bill or something to move to the higher standards across the board. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen at some point. You know, as technology improves, you know, we, we see more and more need to update these standards, which is why W3C has been working on the 2.2 standards and You've probably heard of the 3.0 standards, which is going to be a, a separate uh, document to the WCAG, but it is the kind of thing that has to keep upgrading as the things it applies to upgrade as well. So now let's talk a little bit about the concerns and culture with this. Um, these are some of the questions I hear about in my position as an accessibility program specialist. So when I talk to someone about how they can make their uh, product more accessible or you know, provide training on document accessibility, how to make a Word document or a PDF more accessible, these are usually the three things I will hear about. The first one, and thankfully the majority question I usually hear is, this sounds great, but how do I do this? You know, they, they've never had to think about accessibility before because they've not truly been exposed to uh, the needs of those with disabilities. So usually the starting point is education. You know, for state departments here in Maryland, that is the purpose of my role and the, the IT access initiative. We're here to help train you 
in uh, different types of accessibility and uh, uh, what you might need to do in your role. But there's a lot of outside resources providing education on this. Section508.gov is a website from uh, the US government that provides guidance in lots of different areas, including procurement, content creation, um, meetings, and even uh, 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 press releases and such, providing you know ways to make those accessible on a government level, uh, according to their law. We usually like to refer to that website because Section 508 and NVA, there's a lot of overlap between the two. So it's a good starting point for people. There's also the W3C and uh, the Web Access or the Web Accessibility Initiative. I apologize, I messed that up. Uh, also known as WAI, and they uh, are a, a major resource for learning just about the, the fundamentals of accessibility, learning about the guidelines that all of these laws are built on, and uh, learning how to test and write up reports and such. And then there's accessibility consultants like DQ and Level Access who offer a, a lot of resources uh, in terms of, of learning more formally uh, about accessibility and testing and the, diving into the more technical realm of uh, what makes something accessible. Uh, if you're looking at those, they usually have a cost, but they also help work towards certifications such as the Trusted Tester Certification that I have. There is another organization, um, the International Association of Accessibility Profession Professionals, the IAAP, and they are uh, an organization that uh, provides a, a lot of guidance about accessibility, but then also uh, uh, training and certification in different areas of accessibility. So. And then you can also contact advocacy organizations to just learn more about the impact on those with disabilities in general. Um, we usually like to point people to the National Federation of the Blind, the Center for Excellence in Non-Visual Access, also known as CENA. They are a good resource for learning how these uh, kind of changes or the, this work helps impact those with disabilities or in the case of uh, what isn't done, how that can bar them from getting to information that it, it might be critical. And then uh, there's other ones, such as the National Association of the Deaf, which is located just across the border in Virginia. Um, obviously, they can talk more about how uh, a presentation might not be uh, accessible to them if there's no ASL interpretation, um, especially if there's no captioning, so you don't have both resources together, which is the ideal situation. Um, and then there's other ones for all different uh, areas of disability that can tell you about the impact of not making something accessible on their particular area. So starting with that research uh, helps a lot with uh, finding out why you should do this, getting yourself comfortable with doing it, and then uh, making it part of your work process because making something accessible from the start is a lot easier than trying to go back and fix something. It's significantly more time investment and cost to do that. So making it part of your work process, and especially because it doesn't take that much time, it's usually more adjusting how you do something rather than uh, doing a whole nother step. And by doing that, and making it part of your process, it becomes normalized and we don't have to have these concerns or uh, have you know someone like us coming to you later and being like, hey, someone submitted a complaint about this, we need to learn about this or whatever. So normalizing it is really the goal here. The second thing we always uh, encounter is concerns about resources. We don't have the time or we don't have the money because we're a small team and we only have essentially budget for us, and et cetera. That is a concern. It's a realistic issue that we face. But A, we do need to remember this is required and expected by law. And having a plan in place is really important for how to deal with that. 
Now, that doesn't mean that it, this might be an immediate concern, but it does mean that how, do we, how are we going to address this? We need to prove to people that we are going to work on this if and when, this, when an issue occurs. Because that's really the goal here, as I mentioned, is that total compliance with these laws can be sometimes difficult to achieve since there's some subjectivity to determining how accessible something is. Like you can say there's alt text there, but is it descriptive enough? Or, you know, this form might be usable by someone with using a screen reader, but when the timeout thing appears because they've been idle for a few minutes, how frustrating is that going to be then to dismiss that or you know cause issues to someone with anxiety who's now feeling pressured? So that's why let's have a plan in place, not just for our work process to make something accessible, but for when problems occur and how we're going to handle them. Or, and then also, you know, when we know we have limited resources, how are they best spent then? There is also assistance for this kind of thing. Again, um, I, I mentioned it already, but Maryland agencies can request help from us. Uh, there's also accessibility consultants out there that uh, if you don't have time, there is, uh, but you have money, that they are an excellent resource. They can get things done very quickly. Um, they're also usually uh, good resources for uh, testing products and also assisting with remediation. And then the final question we always, or not the final question we come up against, but the third most common one is, this isn't a priority for us because it's not used by those with disabilities. Point one is that's not guaranteed. Uh, if it's like an internal issue, so you're purchasing a piece of software for your team to use, uh, either, I don't know, like let's say it's an accounting software to handle your budget. Well, that's not, sure, you don't have anyone on your team with a disability now, but can you guarantee that in the future? And can you say if someone applies to that position who has a disability, you can't say to them, well, we can't hire you because we, we don't have accessible software because that falls under the ADA. You've now discriminated against them because you haven't made the effort in the past and trying to make an accommodation for it is going to be more of a problem than if you had just purchased something accessible or worked with the vendor to make it accessible before you used it. The second part is that it removes choice from both you and others. And it, it affects business opportunities as well. Um, an example I like to point to a lot is Apple and their iPhones holds the lion's share of the blind market because they were first out there with a phone that had built-in accessibility features that were good. So Android has spent a lot of time catching up so that market share has shrunk a little bit, but iPhones still hold about 70% of the blind market, according to a survey done by WebAIM. So I, I know that gap was even larger years ago. So the fact that Apple got there first and gave them what they needed as part of the actual product, they didn't need to go and purchase other software to make it work, really won them favor and loyalty. So for those who are not in government and not providing services, that's something to think about is, you know, it might be a smaller market, but if you can dominate it, it's a good business opportunity. And then I, I do also need to mention that uh, anything that's going out to the public, you don't know who's using it or who needs access to it. So that's why you need to think about the broadest scale that you can work with in terms of accessibility and making sure that, again, if we hit those guidelines that are mentioned in the NVA and Section 508 in WCAG, then we know by and large people shouldn't have too many issues with it. Uh, I see a question in the Q and A. Do you like the uh, do you like HTTPS webaim.org? So I just mentioned WebAIM having that survey. Uh, WebAIM is also another good resource. 
for learning about accessibility. Um, I tend not to mention them simply because I usually go to uh, more government uh, relevant in information, um, but WebAIM and then like W3C because they're the ones who create the initial guidelines, but WebAIM is definitely a good resource for learning about this. So by all means, uh, go to them for information. All right, one final concern I want to bring up is overlays and plugins. I bring this up because it is something that's been uh, kind of a hot topic in accessibility for the last couple of years because uh, they're, they're usually sold as quick solutions to becoming accessible. You know, buy our, our overlay or buy our solution, add this line of code to your website, and you know, you're big CAD compliant. It's more complex than that. So my general advice I like to give is don't rely on them. First, there's a legal precedent for that the use of overlays and plugins is not considered compliant. You know, there's been ADA cases that have said, well, the underlying product is not accessible and it requires use of a third party in order to make it accessible. Therefore, it is not considered compliant. So that kind of consideration is that it's not actually solving your problem, especially if a court case uh, lands in your lap. The second point, is that many disabled users and some advocacy organizations don't find them helpful. The NFB made a statement a couple of years ago about how uh, about accessibility and how they don't consider that an effective solution. Uh, other users have uh, made uh, uh, statements about it as well, and also uh, other accessibility specialists have made statements about it. Um, Overlay Fact Sheet, which is a, a linked source there, has a list of signatories who have basically stated that they won't use these products. Um, effectively, the reason for that is because many of the functions and features of these tools are handled by tools that the user already has. So screen readers or magnification or color contrast. Um, and those plugins can sometimes cause compatibility issues or even interfere with that. Um, and they don't always work correctly. Uh, one website I was testing that had a plugin like this that had uh, like a screen reader friendly version, it stripped out things like images and such from the website, which, okay, that removes the problem, but it doesn't remove some of the code, like an image that was a link. You've removed the image, but the link is still there. And there's nothing else to tell me where the link is going. So that doesn't help. And arguably it made it worse because the image at least had, it only had a file name for the alt text, which is bad practice, but the file name was at least descriptive because it had an acronym. Now I have nothing because I'm using the screen reader friendly version. So those are always things to consider when you're using these. So. It's not that you can't use them, it's just you should always consider them as an alternative option that can be chosen to be used. So someone who might just have an injury uh, or something, or say uh, they, they got hit in the eye by something. Um, so now you know their vision is uh, somewhat skewed because they, they're wearing a bandage after going to the doctor. Uh, I speak from experience there. <laughs> um, but having, you know, okay, they go to this website, now they can use that plugin to, you know, change the, the contrast or the font larger, uh, or if, say, like I mentioned earlier, if you're missing your glasses, they can choose to use that option because it's there. But someone who is using that feature that's already built into the computer for magnification already comes to the website, it's already increase to the size that they like, they don't need to use that plugin in order to achieve the same effect. And so that's where that underlying compliance or underlying accessibility of the product itself is more important than just having the tool available. I hope that makes sense to everyone. Uh, this is a, a common topic we come across. So if you have questions about this, please feel free to post them or uh, contact me directly to talk about them more. All right, with that, 
uh, I want to demonstrate a little bit about how this uh, impacts people. So for this purpose, I'm going to use the W3C before and after demonstration, along with the NVDA screen reader. Uh, before I turn on the screen reader, uh, there are a few things I want to talk about on here separately, because this isn't just about blindness, this is about all kinds of disabilities. So the nice thing about this before and after demonstration is it talks about the WCAG 2.0 guidelines. So it's the ones we have in our law, NVA, and Section 508 if you're dealing with federal laws. Um, it also lists the annotations for where are their issues and what are those issues and explains you know, what they are, why they fail, that kind of thing. So you can read this on your own. Um, some things I do want to point out. So if I'm not using a mouse, and I'm using the keyboard to move around. So I'm going to press shift tab to move back one element. If you notice survey changed color and there's a black outline, that is what is known as a fo visible focus indicator. So that tells the user where they are on the page when they are moving through interactive elements. So links, buttons, uh, and um, anything that you could click essentially. So the top part of this part of this page is accessible because it's not part of the demonstration. Now, if I move past that to the actual demonstration, if you notice, okay, City Lights has that outline, Quick Menu has that outline, but now I'm pressing it, I'm pressing it. I don't know where I am anymore. Okay, now I'm at like you know the more link, but these nav menu items here they only change when I hover over them with the mouse. They didn't change when I'm moving them through them with tab. So if I'm just using the keyboard because uh, I can't use a mouse for whatever reason, I don't know where I am on the page. And that kind of impacts, or that definitely impacts, you know, my understanding of, okay, I want to get to news, but, you know, where am I in trying to get to that button? So now I'm at heat wave, but, now I'm trying to get to news and now I'm back at quick menu. So I have to try and guess by pressing, you know, two buttons, will that get me to news or is it going to move to, you know, there, is this a link or something here instead? So those are the kind of issues you can find just by pressing one button on your keyboard and seeing, you know, the impact. And that affects not just someone with physical disabilities, but it can affect someone who doesn't have any disabilities, who's just trying to move through it quickly. I uh, personally don't have any disabilities, but I tend to use both keyboard and mouse at the same time. So I use a lot of shortcuts to, to handle things. And I can use tab when I'm trying to fill out a form and I can just press tab to move to the next uh, uh, form field, fill it out. I don't have to like move and click each single one. But if I don't know which form field I'm on because I'm just pressing tab and I'm guessing where to start, that makes it harder for me. And it can be annoying. It's not you know, truly difficult, it's but it is an irritation. So it's making that improving that user experience as well. So some of these other annotations, as you can see, are usually pointing to like this one is the description of this image, City Lights, where it's this long paragraph. When I demonstrate this with the screen reader, you'll understand more, but that's a lot of reading for a single element. So, but then we have uh, another image later on that doesn't have any alt text at all. So the screen reader is just going to tell us there's an unlabeled graphic, and that doesn't help. So let me turn on my screen reader. NVDA latest window items view go. list. It takes a moment to, to launch. Sorry. So. Welcome to city. Welcome to city lights. Annotated okay. inaccessible home page. Google Chrome. So it reads the, the whole title of the page. That's what that was. So when I'm using a screen reader, it does change how I'm interacting with the website. Instead of pressing, I can use tab to move through to links and such, but I can also use shortcuts to move around the web page quickly. One of these is headings. So headings are 
uh, text usually that is, you know, visually distinguishes sections from each other. But there's a programmatic element to that that acts as bookmarks. So in the case of that Welcome to City Lights text, that is the opening for this, that should be a heading. So if I press H. Annotated inaccessible home page before and after annotations heading level two. If you notice, it jumped all the way down to annotations level two. If I press Shift H to go back to the last heading. Annotated inaccessible home page before and after demonstration heading level one. It went to the very top of the page. That means everything in the demo section, none of it is programmed as a heading. So now as a screen reader user, that forces me to move through all of the elements to read through it rather than jumping to the section I want to. I'm going to quickly skip through to that section. News so, link. Let me move through. Zero here. one link. Red dot with a white letter C that symbolizes a moon crescent as well as the sun. This logo is followed by a black banner that says Citylites, which is the name of this online portal. Finally, the slogan of the portal, your access to the city, follows in a turquoise green handwriting style and with a slight slant across the top banner. Graphic visited link. So we had to spend several seconds listening to that description. And that didn't really tell us all that much useful information. All I really need to know is that this is the City Lights page. So that's, you know, that's a lot. And then if I had like started it and moved, you know, and then I hit tab or something accidentally to move to the next element and I wanted to come back to read the description, it doesn't pick up where I left off. I have to listen to the whole thing again. So that's where having good alt text that's, you know, very succinct and gives us the purpose of that is really important. Now, let me move down to the new section where it lists the, the three stories. So. Unlabeled blank, blank, traffic, today blank, 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 link blank, link unlabeled, gra blank, link unlabeled graphic NAV fat blank, link unlabeled blank. So that's the, the nav menu. And the reason it's saying unlabeled graphic is those icons next to each element. So because of that, it's treating all those as separate things. So I don't know what any of those images are, if they're useful to me. Blank. Welcome to City Lights. So when I move through text in order to read something on the website with the screen reader, I press the down arrow to read text. I can also hold control and press down arrow to hear like a whole paragraph or something. Now I want you to listen to the order that this is read in. City Lights is the new portal for visitors and residents. Find out what's on, book tickets, and get the latest news. Link heat wave link to temperatures. Link 03. Link man gets nine months in violin case. Link lack of brains hinders research. Image, image. Link 04. After three years of effort, city scientists now agree that the primary cause of the 2003 heat wave was hot air from our link annotations. So if you notice, it read the title of all three stories, and then it looked at the images of all three stories, and then it read the actual content of the story. This means I, as the user, now has to understand what story went to what heading. I'm fairly smart. I can figure that out. Most users are going to be able to figure that on their, uh, on their own, but they shouldn't have to make that effort. You know, it should logically just go straight from heading to its content. That's the purpose of it. So that organization of the content on the page affects its meaning, and we need to make sure we preserve what we intend for people to read for everyone who uses it. And that's usually coming down to the order that you put it into the, the, the document object model, or essentially how a website is read out and by the code itself. The styling of a website usually is ignored by screen readers and other assistive technology. So if I was using voice control software, such as Dragon, and I said highlight heat wave, or sorry, select heat wave link to temperatures, I need to make sure that that's text. If it's image of text, and you know, instead if I said select more, which is actually an image, it's not gonna be able to select more. Or in this case, I want to select the more link. Well, there's three more links. It doesn't, Dragon won't know which one to select. And that's why it's really important to make those separately distinguishable for users. Desk pin, paste, I'm going paste the to donate. jump to the accessible version now so you can notice the difference. List with six items, list with. I'm also cutting off the screen reader when I press control. So that's why you kind of hear it going in and out. 
Now, let me try and move through headings again. So I'm pressing H. Annotated accessible homepage so before hear and after demonstration. You hear the starting one, so the very one at the very top. Navigation menu. Welcome to City Lights heading level one. So I have the Welcome to City Lights heading level one. That means I'm now on that content. The reason you don't see it highlighted is because I turned it off on the screen reader because um, it wasn't displaying properly on the second monitor. So I didn't want you to have these boxes that were kind of crossing things. But if I, uh, when I switch off the, the screen reader, we'll see that focus indicator again. Now I'm going to press H again. Heat wave link to temperatures link heading level two. So if you notice, now that news story, that's a heading. So I've jumped straight to the news story, heat wave link to temperatures, just by pressing H twice. That makes it a lot easier to move around this website as a screen reader user. Now I'm going to press down arrow to hear what's after that. Link 03. That 03 is the annotation. We can ignore it. After three years of effort, city scientists now agree that the primary cause of the 2003 heat wave was hot air from Link Heat Wave. Link full story. So if you notice now, okay, now it went from the heading straight to its story and then to the link to hear more. It skipped the image because the image now has what is known as a null alt attribute. So the alt attribute is empty, but it's still there. That tells screen readers this doesn't, this isn't an important graphic, it's just decorative, you can ignore it. If instead we wanted to provide some more information to the users or you know think it's relevant, we could describe that as you know, man wearing hat with a, a, a sunscreen cut out around it. Or uh, in the case of the violin one, we could just say picture of violin in case. Well, sorry, violin in case. We don't want to say picture of. I apologize, I should not have said that. Uh, because if you notice when I was moving across the other graphics, the screen reader was telling me it's a graphic. So I don't need to tell you sir, this is like an, an image. Uh, and then finally, one last thing is sunny me, spells graphic. I want clickable to, city lights, your access to the city. So graphic. that's that logo that had the really long description in the other version. Now it just says city lights, your access to the city. That's all I needed to know. I needed to know that this was their website. If you go to say our website and you find that the first uh, graphic on there, which is going to be the Maryland logo, it should just say maryland.gov because it is a clickable link and it'll take you to the overall maryland.gov website. That is again, all that's truly relevant about that, that, in, that image. So that's where alt text is, its purpose is, is short descriptions that give us the subject matter of that image, or in the case of a graphic link, tells us where it's going to go once we've activated it. Now, let me turn off what my screen NVD reader. Exit. Ex okay, okay. No, that's off. Now I'm going to move through this with just tab. So this is no screen reader. This is just uh, use with a basic keyboard. So oh, let me skip to accessible the page. This is known as a skip to content link. Very useful because now I can just skip the navigation menu. So now if you see there's highlights appearing on the quick menu but they are appearing on the nav menu, which is really nice because if I wanted to buy tickets, I press tab four times, I'm at tickets. I know I'm at tickets because I see the difference in the button from before. That, that, that's where that visible focus indicator shines because I don't have to guess where I am or don't have to try and read that link that appears in the bottom left corner of my browser and say, is that the right link I want? Is that match up? I just know it is because that button is highlighted and it's descriptive and telling me it's a ticket. Okay, uh, I have one question on here. Who do you think can evaluate websites for accessibility? There are a lot of people who can do that. Um, honestly, anyone can if they understand what to look for. Uh, there's a lot of training out there for that purpose. Uh, W3C has some, some basics for you, Section 508. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security has a training program that they call Trusted Tester. That is the certification I have uh, that, is, that essentially says I am trusted by the federal government to be able to test 
things up to the Section 508 standards. Uh, in terms of in Maryland, um, you know, officially it is us at the IT Accessibility Initiative. If you have anyone in your company that has uh, any training in accessibility, they can do so. Um, there are also accessibility consultants out there like DQ and Level Access and um, I think Site Improve to some degree. And there's other ones out there as well uh, who can do that kind of work um, if, you're willing, if you don't have the time, but you have the money. Uh, but if you want to learn how to do that yourself, we do have training, uh, a monthly training scheduled later in the year to show you how to do that. Uh, the NFB also does regular sessions on that. And if you want to, if you're part of a state department, you can also contact us directly for that training. So anyone can, but if you're looking for someone with official uh, you know, guidance or official uh, approval to do so, you can start with us. Are there many jobs to do the work you do and do the pay, positions pay decently? Um, there are a lot of jobs that do this. It's becoming more common. Um, before it wasn't so much, but it has been it has been growing significantly over the last couple of years. Um, most of the big tech companies have you know accessibility teams. Microsoft has a whole department. Uh, Facebook does, or Meta, sorry, Google does, Apple does, um, Adobe, all of them have accessibility teams. In terms of the government, um, the federal uh, departments usually have multiple people who do this kind of work. In the states, um, it can vary because some of the larger departments might have someone who's doing this, or they might do like what we do here in Maryland, where we have uh, a central office that uh, kind of provides guidance and standards for it and then kind of teaches other people how to do it. So the, there are there is a lot out there and it's growing. So if you're looking into this area, it's a good time. Do the positions pay decently? Um, yes, uh, especially out in the uh, private sector. Most of the uh, big companies will usually pay pretty well for accessibility. Uh, I don't really have a true idea of how much that pays, but, uh, or rather a kind of a, an overview picture of it, but uh, I would say most of them are pretty in line with standard IT positions, depending on if you're, you know, government versus private, you know, there's always that difference between the two. <laughs> okay, uh, with that, we are at time. Uh, but if you have other questions, please post them in questions and answers, or you can use chat if you wish. You do have our link to our website. You can also email us at mdod.nva at maryland.gov. You can visit our previous webinars on our YouTube channel. The username is mdtap video. As I mentioned, this webinar will be posted on there. Uh, hopefully within a week. And uh, if uh, you want to review it or someone else you want to see in your office or someone else in your office wants to see it, then they can by all means. Um, and then if you are a State Department rep, you can request a IT solution or website uh, evaluation from us by submitting a ticket to the Do It Service Desk with the subject IT accessibility request. You can also contact me directly if you need to. Um, in cases like that, I'll still send you the service desk, but uh, everything else will, uh, and if you just have general questions, I'm always happy to answer those. With that, we are done unless people have questions. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you, those of you posting in chat, saying that this was helpful, I'm glad to help. Um, if you need to know more, please reach out at any time. Okay, I am going to stop the recording now.